Hi, my name is Adam Merrill, and today I will be talking about the SAS integration library. This is part of the FIU senior project for the School of Computing and Information Sciences. Uh, I'm the only team member, so I'm also the scrum master. My product owner is Brian Dosel over at BrightGage, and Orlando Garcia and Steve Restrepo are both consultants helping me over at BrightGage. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Well, to start off, BrightGage is a business intelligence company that allows, com that allows users to integrate a data source onto a dashboard. And then with this dashboard, they can create visualizations based on attributes of the data and see them change live. So what they want is the ability to test third-party APIs before they integrate it with their product. And namely, they want to be able to view the data in a formatted way to discern the business value it might have to their customers. And so this project's aim is, is to create a web application that will allow them to see the data that comes back in a formatted manner and decide whether it would be something for them to integrate into their main product. In terms of project management, uh, for the Gantt chart here, you can see that th throughout the whole semester uh, about the design document was constantly worked on. The stuff in blue down he down about a third of the way are the uh, the sprints, which you can see uh, are about two weeks in length each. Uh, the little gap in the middle there is spring break, uh, but you can see that the design document was still worked on during that time. Uh, three main milestones. Um, one is when the feasibility study and project plan were completed. And then another is when this final sprint ended and the coding was done for, for this semester. And the final one is once everything is complete and turned in. Uh, so two user stories I'm going to be talking about today. One is view the results in a table and another is being able to add a data source. In terms of being able to view the results in a table, you know, as a user, I want to visualize the results of an API in a table format. So you, someone clicks on something and then the call is made and then the data is returned in a, in a nicely formatted table. As far as adding the data source, uh, the main focus for this semester was on the Trello API. So as a user, I want to add a Trello data source uh, with my own credentials. and by adding a new account, this enables you to view the results. Here you can see the use case diagram. Um, two main users that are that the system is acting upon or acting with. The user, which is a generic anybody who is using the system, and the third-party API, particularly Trello in this in this scenario. Uh, you can see the two user stories I was talking about create data source and view data source. And then you can see a few user stories that extend off of the view data source. Uh, get my cards, get due in seven, and get cards due in seven. So for the sequence diagram for create data source, we can see here that the user is on the data source page and they click the Trello link. Behind the scenes, the controller realizes that they've clicked the Trello link and begins initiating uh, the process with the third-party API. From this point forward, in terms of request token, that's handed off to the third party, uh, and the user logs in and, and says allow or deny, uh, and then the token is sent back to this web application uh, that we're working on. Once the token is returned, the credentials are then passed in to create uh, a credential, API credentials object, and then that's stored in the database. And then that object is used to create an API object, uh, which allows the, the calls to be made behind the scenes. So once those two are stored uh, and the controller realizes that, then it redirects the user uh, to the confirmation page. So now that a, a data source has been created, we wanna be able to view a data source. So in this, in this scenario, the user is on the Trello API page. They can see all the calls that they have available. Uh, they select one of those calls. Uh, that is parsed by the controller. 
behind the scenes, it's queried to get the actual API object, which is return. And then that object is used with the credentials inside of it to go behind the scenes, create a Trello object, which contains the logic for all the calls, which then queries the third party. From the, from the query, the response comes back to the Trello object class, and then it's cleaned up perhaps, depending upon the call, and it's sent back to the, to the call model from the database, and then that is sent to the, to the controller, and from the controller, it is then finally sent to render on a new page. So for the system decomposition, uh, we can see the big picture here, mainly that the architecture is composed of model view template, which is a variation of model view controller. Slightly misleading in some ways. Essentially, the controller is taken care of by the Django framework, and, and views is in some ways deciding what gets passed on to the templates and then therefore what is viewable by the user. Uh, and so views interacts with the API logic that, that we're using to make the requests on the back end. And then views also interacts with the models which uh, are stored in the database. In terms of pipe and filtering, we can see that, so the queries are made through the Trello API, and then there is some cleaning of the data that is done both within the Trello class, as well as depending upon the call and, and what is to be displayed by the views. So for system deployment, there are three main nodes. The host, which is where the web application is sitting. There's the client who's using his or her web browser. And there's the third party host, uh, namely in this scenario, Trello. Client goes on their web browser, hits the server, um, that's where all the logic is, and then we make the queries to the third party. So for the, the data, we can see here the three main things I talked about earlier. So API, sort of the generic term, name and calls. And so using Trello as the example, we can see name would be Trello, and then calls would be a predefined set of calls that we want to be able to make. And so an API is composed of many calls and each call has a name and then each call is associated with its given API. And then each call, once it's made it, made the, the actual request, uh, has a response field. Uh, on the other side, we can see that you can have multiple API credentials, which have their own name. And then those credentials are stored in a, in a JSON field. And then those credentials are associated with an API, which allows, which allows a system to have multiple credentials for the Trello API system without having a one-to-one -one ratio. In terms of security and privacy, Django handles a lot of the security. Uh, they prevent cross-site scripting. They prevent cross-site request forgery. Uh, they prevent SQL injection. They also handle session security throughout the process. In terms of privacy, there's a password for the database and authentication for the Trello accounts is handled by them. Here you can see our minimal class diagram uh, with views here in the center. And there are two main design patterns that were worked on throughout. Uh, one is the abstract factory, um, namely in terms of being able to have the views handle multiple APIs in the future uh, with the logic for those APIs separated outside of it. Uh, another is the command pattern. And so in this pattern, uh, the commands are being initiated by the templates here. And those commands are sent over to the views and those commands are then carried out. We can also see on top here a, uh, the models that, that are used behind the scenes for the database. So uh, sunny day test case, uh, this particular one is its purpose is to validate the addition of a new account from Trello uh, and that it redirects the user to the proper page and adds that information to the database. 
So precondition, the user's on the data source page of the application. The user then selects the data source button, uh, then selects login, inputs the username and the password, and selects allow. So what's expected is that the system redirects the user to a confirmation page, letting him or her know uh, that their information has been added, displaying the username, in this case, from the test account still user, and contains a link to the data sets, as well as the credential information has been added behind the scenes to the database. And the actual output is the same as expected. In terms of a test case for a rainy day scenario, uh, we're taking the same scenario from before, except uh, now we want to validate that if a user changes his or her mind mid addition of a new data source, that the system handles it appropriately. So preconditions, the user is on the data source page of the application. Uh, again, they select the data source button, they select login, they input their username uh, and the password. But at the end, instead of hitting allow, they hit deny. But at the end, instead of hitting allow, they hit deny. And so what's expected of the system is that it should not redirect the user to a confirmation page, nor should it save any information in the database. And indeed, that is actually what happens. So now we're gonna go through a brief overview uh, demo of the actual application. You can see here uh, the main landing page this is the index, and you can follow the data source here to, to add one and you can see it's using the cookies that it's already added one and so then you can come to the data sets and so you can select yours based upon your username this was the one we inputted and from here you have all your calls that can be made uh, for instance get members associated uh, with your account and you can see the output is displayed in a table here so that's a quick overview of how it works and let me come back over here and I just want to say thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed this brief introduction. Thank you.